20 miles away, in the colder waters of the Atlantic, you gaze longingly towards the coast. Didn't you once love someone there? Yes, but it was only a cat, and I, a manatee, what could I do? There are no rewards in this world for pissing your life away, even if it means you get to see forgotten icebergs of decades ago peeling off from the mass to dive under the surface, raising a mountain of seething glass before they lunge back up start their own unknown perilous journey to the desolate horizon. That was the way I thought of each day when I was young, a sloughing off both suicidal and imbued with certain ritual grace. Later, there were so many protagonists, one got quite lost, as in a forest of doppelgangers. Many things were going on, and the moon poised on the ridge like an enormous, smooth grapefruit understood the importance of each and wasn't going to make any one task easier, though we loved her. That was John Ashbury. Welcome to the Inspired Word Cafe. <laughs> woo! Oh, yeah, woo! We're back. Another, another season. Oh, man, it's been so long since the last. It's good to see the exact same smiling faces from the last show that we did. So, um, no, but I, I wanted to start out by reading a John Ashbury poem, just because John Ashbury passed away this summer. Super, super rad poet. If you don't, folks at home, if you don't know John Ashbury, go find him, listen, read. Um, so today we got a super rad show. We're going to try a little bit of a different format. Uh, we've got uh, our guests here from One Button Press, a local fine press. They're going to read some poems, show us some stuff that they've made. Uh, and then we've got Matt Fisher, our musical guest. He's going to play a couple songs. So uh, let's have a big Inspired Word Cafe, warm Cafe inspired, warm, wel welcome inspired, welcome, one button press. Hi, I'm Mel. Um, I'm half of one button press. I have a couple of poems that I'm going to read for you guys. Um, I don't typically read poems in front of people, usually just in front of um, my rabbit at home. So <laughs> this is a treat. <laughs> All right, so the first one is called A Tiger Shark in the Bathtub. Choked begonias choke the drain. A tiger shark tambourine spins in the bathtub. His milky jaws are like fences. All the razors and combs are asleep. He wants some mollusks, and I toss him my apple. I'm stubborn and unyielding. He chomps at my curls. I buy his xylophone smile for a cuttlefish, a splash on the hardwood, a salty breath. The shower curtain is a shield. I don't know why my eyelid quakes. Home Depot doesn't cater bathware to marine life. <laughs> um, all right, these are all super short. Um, the next one is, is a sonnet, which I guess is a form poem that real poets do sometimes. Um, so this one is, is called Picnic for an Ex-Lover. It's the only sonnet I've ever written just because I had to do it for a class and probably will be the only one I ever write. Um, so it goes, black ants loot old stogies and apricots across my weedy yard. They flash their toothpick antennae at bottles of gin, wade through tree rot, Trapes over Walmart flyers strewn with picnic blanket charm. This yard is a playground versed in the high speed trick of abandonment. Gutters leak, black ice melts like night sweats into tunneled dirt until I slip. Although ants use their heads to keep thieves from their homes, skulls press through windows like wine bottle corks, they'd be shattered by my fall. Fate and intent aren't distinct acts. Did you know all worker ants are female? Males for the long haul resemble you. Great value coupons whisked up the street, assured by the solace they find in retreat. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and last one um, is also a form home. It is a villanelle, which um, we, we, had a, we had a saying about villanelles in my class one time. I, I can't say it on TV, but they suck. <laughs> <laughs> this one actually um, just got published um, in Prairie Fire, so you guys should maybe check that out, too. Um, it's called She Builds Her Eulogy. 
Wait as the creator circles typos in her eulogy, church basements filled with folding chairs house self-help groups. Okanagan waves are a comfort in her memory. She sleeps like a splinter in a fingerprint, usually mixes antidepressants with vodka and Fruit Loops, waits as the creator circles typos in her eulogy. Stenciled to her left eye, really quite suitably, is the smudge that no one mentions, a ring-shaped bruise still. Okanagan waves are a comfort. In her memory, there are no greasy bags from taco joints floating knee-deep as decoration, no spitball straws to breathe through. Wait as the creator circles typos. In her eulogy, she cannot swim but jumps into waters too easily. Middle finger held high to her reflection. Screw you. Okanagan waves are a comfort in her memory. Everyone wears goggles in heaven. Or is it the sea? Both, she thinks, are the same, just different shades of blue. Wait as the creator circles typos in her eulogy. Okanagan waves confine her to her memory. Hey, I'm Crystal Smith, and I'm the other half of One Button Press. I don't read poetry in front of my rabbit because I'm actually a human pickle, so I don't own a rabbit, but all right. Okay, so... This poem is dedicated to my great-grandmothers who came before me, and it's called The Excavation of Ponce de Leon. Chittering women gather in a circle in the base floor of the hospital annex in Pocatello, Idaho. Their button-down shirts and paisleys and pastels cover up pregnant bellies. Middle-aged men grasp their palms, fingers intertwined like a twisting three-dimensional model of a double helix. Some women are young, rounded cheeks closest to the adolescent years. Jean skirts cover up their Mormon garments and gel plasters hair in tight ponytails. Keeps modesty close to the skull. Trilling nerves come from their questions Epidurals, scalpels, and fetal heart monitors dispose of fear with Pitocin-filled glubbing and periodic beeps. Eight months pregnant, heavy with thoughts of my grandmother who once lived in the Windermere Valley, her blood running from Clan Fraser to Huron to Tecumseh, Ontario. I'm living where the Shoshone were displaced, Convergence of the Lemhi River and the River of No Return. Pot-bellied stove near small hardwood floored rooms from the 1920s. Perhaps a miner and his family lived here once, drifting in from Gilmore or Leesburg. Places now forgotten in the bitter roots. Sagebrush knocking against depression newspaper plastered on walls. Tattered gingham curtains swaying against rigid grime in the breeze, faded in 100 years of sunshine. They say Sacagawea came from this place. A carved statue of her holding her baby is all that remains. Greeting Japanese tourists at the front of a nature center with winding gravel paths that lead sanctimoniously through strange dome structures that are labeled as sweat lodges. Red willow bends and curves near the flowing river makes a basket out of the land. A bronze replica of a grizzly bear paws at jumping copper cast salmon long since dead to dams. Signage along the highway to Mud Lake reads about the mercury poisoning of Lewis and Clark. Always Sacagawea immortalized in the national parks, brown and yellow, pointing west, a destiny manifested. Millions of years of grandmothers live in my blood. They whisper when I step on the pavement, gray skies frothing in winter depression. Annette took me on as her apprentice, asked me why I should be a midwife, saw my great-grandmother holding open her hands in Oyen, Alberta, catching a baby, wiping off vernix, and then gently reclaiming the suffering. Midwife, undertaker, 
mother, her teleological job title, even though the living were afraid to handle the new, the old, the dead. Phone calls in the middle of the night, most often 3 a.m., full moons are busier, a round of prenatal labor and postpartum, weighing babies in swaddling, cotton flannel baby scale sling. One night, Annette tells me of dreams of full bursting fruit, flowers budding in heavy rains. And yet another, a woman walks clumsily along a railroad path, dreams each night of finding a dead calf half removed from its amniotic sac. This, she tells me, is a cord prolapse. Place your hand gently on the baby's head. Watch the fontanelle. Push up to allow flow through the umbilical cord. Call 911. We women, unafraid, stand in the pools of water that come from between our grandmother's legs. Because he's never going to watch this. This is dedicated to the man who saved my life twice. All right. I drove on a road today I don't normally take home, one hand on my beige steering wheel following a curve in the industrial section of town, chain link fences and storage units. I saw your Dodge truck strung up like a sacrificial lamb riding towards its death. That faded silver hood ornament gone, rust riddling the sides of the truck like lines on a map. Or maybe it's more like string spiraling on the floor, follow it to the end. Specters in the upholstery, they rise and fall with the smell of your body, a phantasmagoric dance in the cab of your truck. I could use my words to say something about screaming and silent, straining against my steering wheel, about how my fingers can't grab tight enough to open a pickle jar that I hand to you. My palms push and hold, but if I could use my words to sing to you, it might sound something like a grown man wailing in the night, crying for things he lost and crying for things he promised. It might sound like a girl stuck in a body where she doesn't belong, sliding down a door while that man stands outside and listens. Concrete and metal, I read a story about a woman who thinks often of the Hoover Dam because she says it will never go away. A star map to commemorate that once a people lived here who dreamed and died. And the city dump is piling up with all the things you threw away. I live my life waiting to die, my wail silenced to words on a page, and maybe I'm a poet because I never found the right words to say the things I mean. If I could trap my sadness in a moment, it disappear like city lights, diminishing when I pass from the Okanagan tendril of the Sonoran Desert, straight cut into the Rockies. Highway 97 North in meditative swings. Clacking of keys, their sounds hollow on my pinewood desk, a monitor with no blue lighting, and my words are brilliant for all their pain. My heart a spectacle to be graded, forgotten, teased. I learned early to hide under blankets, under mattresses, behind clothes in closets, clutching a teddy bear with a corduroy bow tie. A wind-up clock tucked where its heart should be, ticking for closeness, for comfort, conversations in the dark. Maybe no one will hear me. They take my hand in their hand, warm large palms closing over mine, lead me away, away from mothballs away from sequin dresses on wooden hangers, swaying against dry cleaner plastic. My friend Ian told me once, I was just like that Joni Mitchell song with Peter Gabriel, and the lyrics go something like this. You're a special case for my special place. A style of rocks near the steam train on the Isle of Man a red dirt mountain with sagebrush, cougar warnings, and a full view of Pocatello at night. Lights going yellow in the pollution, pink at dawn. A glen near some old men who still trap conies and eat them for supper, tipping their, tipping their longshoremen's caps. A beach covered in pink fleshy squids dying in the gray air of the Irish Sea. An old truck going around the curve of a roundabout.
Thank you. All right, we're back here with uh, Melissa and Crystal from One Button Press. Um, I was just wondering maybe if you could just talk a little bit about the press. Uh, maybe tell us how it got started. Sure. Uh, Melissa and I actually got involved um, in writing in the writing community maybe a little bit later on than some people do. And um, we were able to kind of bond and form a relationship that was based a lot on um, collaborative work. And we wanted to do something that was an embodied practice of building community with our peer network. And so we um, wanted to help people publish their things um, local to Kelowna and the Okanagan. And we wanted to do it in such a way where we could showcase maybe some skills that are not necessarily at the center of kind of um, a lot of art scenes. So using craft and, and um, like collaboration even with my son. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so, so you guys, you guys got a grant, right? Yeah, we yeah. have a grant from United Way and Gen X, and um, the mandate for our grant is that we specifically publish Kelowna youth writers, and so um, we're always looking for young Okanagan writers who would like to collaborate with us in creating these chat books. Cool. Um, uh, you know, just thinking through sort of the act of making in terms of poetry, I was just wondering maybe if you if you want to talk a little bit about your relationship to the made object of poetry, say versus poetry as performance or poetry, um, you know, as just sort of a commercial object. Sure. Yeah. So I I think there's a tendency um, for us to be very object oriented, and so in creating objects for us, it's more about relationships actually. And so we have a relationship to the embodiment of like a particular theme of poetry. Um, this work, for example, is a... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vanna. <laughs> I can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we, we have a very serious show, so if we could... <laughs> Just the integrity level is going down here. Our we've seven mem studio members are... We've lost it, guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this, this is our chat book, which showcases our work, which Melissa actually read from this evening. Um, and it's called Hide and Seek. And so you can see we've created kind of like a vellum paper that vaguely is organic looking, and it covers up the title. So you sort of have to move through an organic layer Sweet. to get to this title. Vellum. Yeah. No, I don't know that one. It's just like... Transparency paper that you use. <laughs> that's the scientific term, <laughs> transparency. It yes. It, that's uh, the Oxford definition. Right. So, so. Of or pertaining to thelium. Right. Yes. Of yes. course. Um, I, okay. I think we're we're getting close to the end here. So um, I thought maybe it, it can can we find you? How to, if if I'm if I'm a youth poet out there who's aspiring, how can I how can I get you to make something beautiful of my you know mediocre work? Yeah, so you can contact us at onebuttonpress at gmail.com or you can find us on Facebook and just type in One Button Press and look for it. Awesome. Well, yeah. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for doing that reading. Um, we're, we're doing a bit of a different format. Like I said, tonight we're going to have a musical guest. Uh, we've got Matt Fisher in the house. Uh, he's, he's got a new EP out called Sleepwalking. He's going to play a song off that. He's going to play us uh, a different original tune, so stick around for that. Uh, and yeah, thanks for coming out. Appreciate thanks it. Thanks for having us. Yeah, woo! Hi, I'm uh, I'm Matt Fisher. That's not my real name. The song is called Black Lungs. Born to a coal miner's son and a cowboy's daughter. Never much like the town where I grew up, but we made it out alive, and I guess that's good enough. Used to play down by the river, came home, and the street lights came on. Mixtapes of our favorite songs We sing them in the car In this veil of diamonds It's made for strong hearts And this wool on my shoulders It's carried with strong Let 
dangers and I still ain't seen my money and I don't know where my friend has been but I'm glad he's still alive and pushing up them daisies it's hard not to hold any grudges but it ain't exactly a fault and I'll just drown in regret and four fingers of that single mom and this veil of diamonds it's made for strong hearts and this world on my shoulders is carried with strong arms and to pierce through my armor strong words and sharp tongues but I assure you that my heart is blacker than my lungs cut like wire they turned into scars we grew up on hilltops and trailer parks the scenes on my screen went from silver and black and I swore to myself and I'm never never going back again and this veil of diamonds it's made for strong hearts and this world on my shoulders is carried with strong arms Strong words and sharp tongues But I assure you that my heart is blacker than my lungs But I assure you that my heart is blacker than my lungs But I assure you Thank you very much. That was off uh, my EP that's out. It's called Sleepwalking. This song is not, though, because I felt like playing it. It's one of my faves. Here we go. Hope you sing along, Cole. It's called Deja Vu. Just in case that it hits me That I've spent the better part of a decade Not being all I could be Being numb's better than being alone So we got too drunk, we got too stoned And all of the times that I altered my mind Well, we never had a reason, never had no rhyme Had some deja vu. The bus is coming. I know when I kiss you goodbye that I'll never ever see you again. And now we're talking to the radio. This place is haunted. Can't have this dance, baby, cause this is the last song. This is the last song. Her bedside, 
for whatever goes bump in the night. But when I moved in on the first of the year, old Louie went out of sight. And I make my living in a kitchen, working 40 hours a week. And the neon sign when I smoke outside is starting to burn a hole through me. And I remember writing forgettable tunes, playing to myself in the animal balloons. And I remember having panic attacks, knowing you were planning on never coming back. I just had some deja vu The bus see is coming in I knew when I kissed you goodbye That I'd never ever see you again Now we're talking to the radio This place is haunted Can't have this dance, baby Cause this is the last song Deja vu. Oh, the bus is coming. I know when I kiss you goodbye that I'd never ever see you again. Now we're talking to the radio. This place is haunted. Can't have this dance, baby, because this is the last song. I just had some deja vu. Is coming. I knew when I kiss you goodbye that I'd never ever see you again. We're talking to the radio. This place is haunted. Can't have this dance, baby, cause this is the last song. This is the last song.